The views and opinions in this program are not those of CESA 7 or Spectrum. Okay, welcome everybody um, to this uh, September 12th, 2022 um, board meeting, a, a work session. We're going to start with the roll call. Smith? Here. Becker? Here. McCoy? Here. Leighton and Warren? Here. Welch? Here. Lyerly? Here. Mills? Here. Okay, um, everyone is in attendance. Um, uh, Andrew Becker will be uh, joining us remotely. Um, and uh, so I, I would entertain a motion to convene into closed session. Who would like to read the motion? Okay, Don, thank you. Okay. I move that the board convene in closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statute 19.851A and F considering financial, medical, social, or personal histories or disciplinary data of specific persons, preliminary consideration of specific personnel problems, or the investigation of charges against specific persons, except where par B applies which, if discussed in public, would be likely to have substantial adverse effects upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data, or involved in such problems or investigations, to wit, for the purpose of holding hearings under Wisconsin Statute 120.131C and E3. Second. Okay. Um, is it all in favor? Or do we have to vote on we it? We need a roll call vote. Okay. Thank you, Melissa, for keeping us on track. Kinsey? McCoy? Aye. Smith? Aye. Mills? Aye. Welch? Aye. Becker? Aye. Leighton and Warren? Aye. Lyerly? Aye. Okay. We are adjourned into a closed session, not adjourned. We are, we are what? Recess, <laughs> okay. We're going to reconvene into open session now. Um, we are joined by our interim superintendent, Vicki Beyer, and Genevieve Winkler from um, Inner City Student Council and members of the cabinet. And I think that we can go ahead we don't need to take the roll call. And the next thing on the agenda is our public forum. We have one person and it is Christina Shelton. Go ahead. Uh, do we have a mic, Josh? Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know I was going to go first. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. It's nice to see you. Happy start to the school year. Um, I hope it's going well. I am here to talk about the uh, resolution you all are bringing up on school meals. I am Christina Shelton, the state representative to the, to the 90th Assembly District. Uh, I am a parent to two kids uh, in, the, in the Green Bay District, and a former school board member. So thank you, school board members, for your Leadership. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Byer, uh, for your leadership. Uh, thank you to your food service department as well 
for all of their work and to all of our teachers. Thank you. I'm so happy that you took my children back this year. Um, <laughs> I am uh, thrilled that you're bringing this resolution forward. Um, as you all remember back in March of 2020 when the COVID pandemic hit, we did something revolutionary that food champ food, school food champions were told for years that we couldn't do, and that was simply to just feel. And I was on the school board at the time, and I was over at Franklin Middle School, and we were able to give school meals, breakfast and lunch to families that they, they were coming through without having to check their eligibility or anything like that. If the families would come through, they would say, we need X amount of meals. We would get up and we would put it in their car and they would be on their way. Well, as this program transitioned and as districts transi transitioned from virtual back to in-person and back to virtual, it gave flexibility for districts to meet the needs of not only their kids, but of their families, but also to work with teachers and food service workers. So what happened was when I was in the legislature- Did we lose audio? Hello, can you not hear me? Can you hear I us, Andrew? Hearing, now, I, now I can, but I went from hearing Christina clearly to almost not at all, just so you know, from this side. Now, Andrew? Do you want to just join at the table? Thanks, Christina, sorry. Can you hear me now, Andrew? Yep. Okay. So what happened was we were meeting with farmers and growers and we started to understand the positive benefits of universal school meals. One was an economic boost for our farmers and growers. It was transformational for working families, especially mothers and fathers who were sending their kids off to school. But we also saw the impact on food service departments, food service directors, but also food service workers. So from that work and actually working with the food service department here in the Green Bay Area Public School District, we built the Healthy School Meals for All Coalition which in November of 2021 authored a bill called the Healthy School Meals for All Act. This is a bill that would uh, maximize federal reimbursement rates for free and reduced meals, but would also have the state uh, buy into the meal program by providing general purpose revenue dollars to make sure that every kid, every kid, no matter where you go to school in the state of Wisconsin can have access to a free breakfast and free lunch. From that work, we have built a coalition of almost 100 statewide members. We launched the bill in Pulaski in the Pulaski School District, and we did that intentionally because we want to talk about this not from an urban school district perspective, but from an all school district perspective. Since then, the uh, Sun Prairie School District, I think they have passed a resolution. The Ashwaubenon School District has also passed a resolution. Districts from around the state are joining our coalition. So I am excited that you're going to be having this conversation today to talk not only about the bill, but to talk about the importance of school meals and joining our work because we know we have a long road ahead. The exciting news is that momentum is growing. We just last week, Governor Evers put forward a budget proposal that would provide additional money uh, in the next budget biennium to expand school meals. So we're still waiting on the details of that, but that is a good movement. We also are seeing uh, some movement at the federal level as well. And the coalition is working on that to advance what we'd ideally like to see is a universal model nationally. But if our federal delegation fails to do that, we're gonna prepare to take action at the state level for as long as it takes. We're also seeing other states take action too. Just last week, the governor of Pennsylvania announced that he will be implementing free school breakfast through the rest of the school year. States like California and Vermont have also taken action as well. So what we're excited about is not only that you all are engaging in this conversation, but hopefully you'll be engaging with us in the work over the long term ahead, because we know that it's going to benefit not only, again, your students, but your teachers and your families. This will infuse a significant amount of sustainable funding into your food service department that will help to increase pay for food service workers, expand farm to school, expand uh, investment in, in kitchens and cooking utensils and cafeterias, but will also rem remind us as educators and school board members that hungry kids can't learn. We believe in the coalition that school meals are just as important to learning as pencils, books, and great teachers. 
and we want to elevate the issue and we welcome you into the coalition and thank you for bringing this forward to your school board meeting tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. All right. Is there anybody else? No. Okay. Then we will move on to um, our next item, which is uh, falls under educa education. And I think Andrew, are you prepared to lead? That I guess I'm it might prepared be to, to lead. Being... Yeah, I'm prepared to lead, but I think we determined maybe that it was better to to hand that off uh, if the chair is remote, and I'm I'm willing to to do so if someone's willing to to do it. Okay. All right, I'll I'll do it. It, it would be hard to um, to uh, kind of monitor the discussion. So, all right, thank you. Uh, then we're going to move on to item four um, A, and I'm going to actually pass that on to Vicky. Thank you. Thank you. And tonight we're joined by Claudia Henriksen, who is our executive director of student services, and Katie Selzer. Did I say executive? And then Katie yeah. Selzer, our Director of Pupil Services and Equity. Hey guys. Did you need to do roll call yet? We did it before closed session. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, though. Great. Right. Good evening. Thank you for inviting us to speak tonight. Uh, we're here to provide three different things. One, a brief update on the equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, task force work, um, as well as then the proposed core commitments that we've um, drafted. And then lastly, share what our next steps would be with our EDI work. And when I say EDI, short for equity, diversity, inclusion. So in during 2021, uh, EDI task force uh, was developed and it was comprised of approximately 70 community, family, um, students, staff, um, and the demographics were representative of our district. So we brought together the team. Um, we did lose some participants along the way. It was a quite lengthy process and it lasted the full year. At times we uh, had to pause a month or so when after uh, the holiday break, there was a, an upsurge of, of cases as well as people were needing a little bit of a break. So we met eight times throughout the 21-22 school year. The first few meetings were to develop the equity purpose statement and equity core values, as you'll see in the noted memo that's attached to the board agenda. And so the purpose of our task force was really to complete a root cause analysis of our data. And our data included the Hanover survey data. I don't know if everyone remembers in April of 2021, um, we did a survey with the help of Hanover research and was sent out to all secondary students, all families, and um, all staff. And it was really a survey around inclusion and belonging, as well as some other areas of focus. And then we looked at our graduation data, our suspension data, college career community readiness, as well as state testing and then our ACT scores. And so the first few sessions we really spent analyzing the data, looking at the data, reviewing it, um, and getting in small groups to share our observations on the data. And those were, so next then we took those observations and categorized them into problem statements. And um, we had eight, I believe it was eight problem statements. And from those problem statements, then teams shared um, in their small groups, really the potential influencers or causes of those problems. We then identified what those greatest influencers are, so we really prioritized. And then from there, um, drafted the core commitments. And that really, those core commitments would address those, those influencers or causes. So that brings us where we are at today. And then Claudia is going to share with you, and I know some of you have the core commitments in your hands, but just for public as well as those attending tonight. I didn't know if we want to read those. Um, and then she will also share what our next steps would be because really our work is is still much in front of us. So would you like 
Would you like us to share those publicly for those that are listening at home? Okay, so our first one is equitable access and the G, um, Green Bay Area Public Schools will review and revise current processes and practices that inhibit student access to high quality curriculum, instruction, support, and other educational resources with a specific focus on a multi-level system of support and academic planning practices. The second core commitment is a culture of ex culture. <coughs> of ex Green Bay Area Public Schools will increase the achievement of all students through instru instructional and grading practices that honor and build upon the assets of every student, providing educational resources and materials that reflect the diversity of students and staff, actively recruit, employ, support, and retain culturally diverse and culturally and linguistically responsive workforce with a focus on experienced educators working with the most underserved students and provide learning opportunities to eliminate educational disparities between groups of students. And last, the third one is welcoming and safe environment. And Green Bay Area Public Schools will provide to all staff learning opportunities on culturally and linguistically responsive practices and create an inviting and an inclusive environment in all facilities that reflects and supports the diversity of the student population, their families, and our community. Now that's a huge mouthful of things that we're going to do, but that's because that's just the core commitments that we're going to ask you all to approve as a board for us to move forward in our next phases of the work. And that's where we're really going to dig in deeper. So the next um, piece of our work, the second phase, is just beginning and we um, and it'll begin once we get finalized after tonight, end of the, the two weeks from now's meeting. Um, and we wanna be able to create measurable goals with identified outcomes. So what are the goals we're going to do that are gonna, that we're gonna put under every one of these three core commitments? What are the action steps aligned to those goals? So how do we get from point A to point B? And it probably won't be in one year. Um, and finally, it's a system to, we have to develop a system to monitor our progress. Right now we have met as an educational team um, so that this is the work of all of our, um, all of our departments to work, to move this work forward embedded into everything that we do as a district. And so any questions? I think one of the, um, ahead, Laura. Oh, Laura, you had one, go ahead. I just wanted to share that I was involved on the task force for some time during this. I wasn't able to attend all of the meetings, but did attend the majority of them. And I think this is very um, important work. I'm glad to see it moving forward. And I appreciate that you guys brought this forward. I think the only thing, and, I, and I've shared this um, with the team before is how do we move forward to ensure that we have the voices in the room and putting um, input into how do we move this forward? What actually, um, what actions can take place? Um, and then also within the uh, core commitment, there was an article that came out today um, talking about the teachers in the school district and our, and our lack of um, diversity for our students. And I think we need, um, in the, the second part of your core commitments, we really need to, um, and it's not just here, you know, the article covered that it's, that's a, it's a challenge, but how do we have those um, mirrors for students that they can see themselves and the teachers? And um, it's a bigger issue, but I'm glad that we're actually starting to address these things in our district. Thank you, Laura. One thing I, as you speak about um, representation, once the plan is starting to be built and once we are designing it, um, wanting to bring back um, the task force to at least offer 
input. And I know some of them are like, okay, uh, we're done. I'm done. So we would need to just maybe refresh um, with who that is so that we have representation that isn't, you know, um, uh, just those of, of district staff. Okay, so we would bring this back then to the regular board meeting for a vote for the board to adopt. James? What do you envision the next touch point or next <coughs> governance ask would be? So you're asking us to agree to and support the core commitments. Um, the task force ha has been disbanded at this point, right? So it's the work of the district. So what comes next? Uh, you identify the goals and, and action items against those goals. Will you bring those back to the board for our review and approval at that point? I believe what we're going, to, what we would do was keep you updated on the action steps and where we're going and the data and those types of things. The governance questions, I believe this is the only governance question that would need to come to the board, but we would fully be um, ready to come forward once a year, twice a year, however much the board um, would like it to come forward to give you updates on where we're at. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, thanks to Dr. Wiegand, we are um, implementing program evaluation. We consider this something that should be evaluated regularly and bringing it to the board with updates. It's our responsibility, if you adopt this in two weeks, it's our responsibility to make sure we're working towards those objectives. And that you as a board feel confident in what we're, show, we're sharing with you to know that we are moving forward. Go ahead, Laura. One more comment. I think as we roll this out, the whole plan and, and moving forward to um, bring the community and families along with us that we need to make sure that the language is um, understandable and something that people can get on board with. And if, because like the multi-level system of support, most people won't know what that is. And I know it's, this is, you know, for the audience and everybody that put it together, but as we roll it out moving forward, I wanna make sure that it really um, resonates with the community at large to understand where are those initiatives that we're going to be taking to move the needle. Would it be possible for somebody to do a, just like a, a bit of an explanation of what that is? Cause it's been a while since we've talked about that multi-level systems of support. Oh, sure. Yeah, this, <laughs> but it's I was a gonna, small definition. I was going to make a quick comment that, um, to your point, Lori Blakesley identified that the community might have a hard time interpreting what this meant. So she's already been working on some language to simplify it. Multi-level systems of support is the uh, the model that we follow. It's a framework that we follow for interventions and addressing behavior and learning needs. And we. We adopted that what four about four years ago, maybe, maybe even five by now. Okay, yeah. it's been it's been in in place for a while, but you know we just, we haven't like revisited it for mm -hmm. a while. We can James. Hold so when we had the task force that evaluated early start times, um, the board of directors had access to work papers. Right, we got to see the study. We got to see raw evaluation materials that they used. Is there any access that can be provided to problem statements or things that you looked at in, in the observations you saw in the data? We we do have it all um, available in a file, and I can work with Vicky or whomever to try to get. Okay. Okay. Are there any more questions? Vicki, is there anything else you want to add? No, thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. We're moving on to um, under education uh, 4B Head Start Program Guidelines and Operational Procedures Handbook and Policy Council Bylaws. <laughs> that's a mouthful. Yes, that's a lot. <laughs> Tonight, we're joined by Patty Mevis, uh, who is our Head Start Learning Center principal, and Andrea Lanware, our executive director of school leadership. Patty's brand new in her role. 
Thank you, President McCoy and members of the board for allowing us the opportunity to address you tonight. I'm Andrea Landwehr. I'm the Executive Director of School Leadership Development and Support. I partner closely with all of the directors of Head Start and then the directors of 4K through 12 um, education um, to support the 42 schools in the Green Bay School District. Tonight, Patty Mavis, who is the co-director of Head Start and the principal of Head Start Learning Center located in Bellevue. Um, she's with us tonight to discuss with all of us program and procedural changes um, to the Head Start handbook. Thank you. So I'm Patty Mavis, uh, as Andrea said, the co-director of Head Start with Mary McCabe and Mary apologizes for not making it this evening. Um, we work closely uh, with Laura Layton and Warren and Nancy Welsh as our liaisons this year. So we'll be meeting regularly to try to keep them up to date. There's so much to Head Start. So we'll keep them apprised of that. And then of course we'll have regular meetings or we'll have regular appearances at the board. The Head Start performance standards require us to update our program guidelines and operational procedures annually and share that with our Head Start Policy Council and our governing board, our school board here. In addition to this, we train all of our staff on that. Rather than give you the 120 page document, we give you the updates to what we've done. So for this year, uh -huh. um, we accepted that <laughs> feedback many years ago. So uh, the, on page number seven, we revised our start and our start and end or our start time for the full day classrooms. We were starting at 8:30. We've upped that to 8:20. That was uh, through some feedback with parents and staff. In doing so, we were able to eliminate three Fridays that we were pulling kids into school. Our attendance rates were not fabulous. Uh, it was extra cost for busing and upset some of the the kids' kind of routines for those three random weeks. So. Uh, so that is the reason that change happened. It still provides us our 1,020 hours of student contact. Um, second revision was removing the reciprocity agreement that we've had in place for many years between uh, Head Start in the Green Bay Public Schools and other um, Head Start programs outside of the Green Bay Public Schools that we've, we've been able to take kids back and forth, but um, in reviewing um, district procedures with open enrollment, we needed to follow that same process and our outside district where our other Head Starts are located do not offer the same three-year-old 3K programming, so we couldn't um, legally accept kids through that. Uh, another change for us was now that we've settled into Jefferson Head Start with the remodel and we were actually in the building. We were, we were not in it for a little while with COVID. Uh, we have moved, it's a, there's more space and it made more sense to have our parent center, which is like a resource center moved over to Jefferson. And additionally, um, that is becoming our main office. We have, um, we are now also, that's where children, if they ride the bus and can't be dropped off at home, rather than coming back to the Head Start Learning Center, we are moving that over to the Jefferson Head Start. We have a new clerical person. The acronym for it is URSIA. It stands for Eligibility, Recruitment, Selection, Enrollment, and Attendance. That clerical person is located at Jefferson. Um, so it just made sense to have, to have our main office over there. We, uh, we fall under the district contract for transportation. And this year, our transportation contract includes first student, rather than Lamers East. Uh, that does not impact our budget in any way. So um, we're just getting started with that. Um, we've updated a lunch monitor position description that we have one lunch monitor at each site and that description uh, is reflects more of their, their what they're actually doing in that position now that we're in our own buildings. Um, we've added two items to our selection criteria. The Office of Head Start tasks us with creating a selection criteria to be able to enroll students in our program. And that is based on our community data and our district data. Um, in addition to that, there was new regulations that came out this spring that we needed to add SNAP, which is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. If families are receiving SNAP, they're 
categorically eligible for Head Start, which is another way of checking income. We've always checked income through 1040s or um, W-2s. So this just adds another, um, in many ways, an easier way for families to enroll in Head Start. We also uh, have four classrooms where the special education department works through IEP meetings and determines that some students are placed in Head Start as their least restrictive environment. Uh, in some of our new director training, we were learning that we needed to make some adjustments to that. We can't in Head Start hold spots. Therefore, we are allowed to assign points to those students. And if when we assign extra points to those students, then they do qualify and, and are able to take one of those spots. So overall, we, we streamlined the document. Hopefully it, it makes it a little bit easier to read for most people. Um, and that should sum up our changes. Go ahead, Brian. If you could, sorry, if you could uh, clarify a little bit more, the open enrollment, um, we don't accept, I mean, students aren't allowed to open enroll from other districts into Head Start because their districts don't provide that. Am I reading that correct? So we can't open enroll a student who's three by September 1st into our district. And yeah, the, um, we're following the district procedures on open enrollment. Previous to that, we fell back onto our reciprocity agreement that if there was a Head Start in Howard, we could take those students. Now they have to they have to fill out the online enrollment. Uh, so a four-year-old in Howard Swamico could come to a Head Start, um, but the three-year-old because they don't have a three-year-old program. Hey, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I hit the button. Sorry. And a follow up to that, that's, and maybe I'm just missing a key part of this. That's a board policy or that's a state, that's a federal regulation with it? Um, we're actually, I believe, following the state guidelines, and which is has become a district guideline where Head Start often are Head Start regulations. When they're stricter, they we follow Head Start regulations. But in this case, um, this was a, a really solid review of Mary McCabe, who has solid um, 4K experience. Brian, if I could just offer, I'm sorry, I'm not there. So this makes it weird for me to chime in because uh, we have a district Head Start program. We have to follow Wisconsin laws with respect to Wisconsin public school districts and Wisconsin's open um, enrollment law says that if the sending district does not have that program in their school, then the receiving district, the non-resident school district cannot um, admit the student into it's through open enrollment. So for example, when um, De Pere did not have 4K for a long time. And so anyone who had applied to Green Bay from De Pere for 4K through open enrollment, we had to decline because De Pere didn't have a 4K program. Now that they have a 4K program, students can open enroll into the Green Bay School District for 4K. Because no other public school district has a 3K Head Start program, we cannot admit students through open enrollment into the Green Bay Area Public School District. And we had not been following that in uh, previously. And thanks to Mary, that was discovered. Okay. So it's it's a hard and fast cannot, not a may not. It's we just cannot do that. We cannot under state law for open enrollment. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Are there any other questions? Did you guys have anything else? Is that it? Thanks for the update, guys. Okay, we're going to move on under education to C, which is course book for the 2023-24 school year. Yep, go ahead, Vicki. Okay, tonight we are joined by uh, Dr. Chartier, who is Executive Director of Teaching and Learning, and Dr. Khan. Associate Director of Teaching and Learning, oh, as well as Dr. Wiegand. Interim hey. Deputy Superintendent, anybody else want to come up? Anyone? <laughs> Every year uh, we come forward with this, so we'll turn it over to Nancy to get us. Thank you very much, and thank you all for the invitation to review our draft course book this evening. We're changing it up just a little bit. In just a few moments, um, Dr. Khan is actually going to uh, present the draft course book for both middle school and high school. 
um, pr part of his presentation tonight, he'll give an overview of what goes on behind the scenes to develop that course book. I know in the past, we just bring you books and with information. So he's prepared to give a presentation of what goes on behind the scenes um, in creating the course book um, and what goes into the decision-making. And then uh, we've asked Dr. Wiegen to join us in case the board would have any questions that might be more futuristic of what we might be looking at in the future. And so with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Dr. Khan. Thank you and good evening. Um, so as uh, Dr. Chartier mentioned, we provide uh, both the middle school and the high school course books to you tonight um, with a summary of the updated revisions to them. Um, and these reflect the district's priority of providing students the opportunity to personalize their academic pathway for their intended post-secondary goals. Uh, both books are organized into two broad sections. Um, the first section of the course books provides uh, overviews and information regarding our academic and career planning processes and then the, and the various academic programs offered within the district. And then the second section describes um, the courses offered in the district broken down by department area. When we consider either new courses or major revisions to our courses, um, there are a number of aspects that we consider that we'd just like to inform you about tonight. Um, one of the main uh, considerations is the alignment of the courses within the subject areas course sequence, um, an academic and career pathway, and the alignment uh, to post-secondary programs. And within those considerations, especially for post-secondary programs, we look at uh, how we provide opportunities for dual credit courses that are either aligned to stackable credentials or how they're aligned to preparing students for our post-secondary post programs and majors. And we look at um, first our neighboring uh, community uh, colleges, but also we look at programs statewide as well um, to try to provide, prepare our students as broadly as possible. The other opportunities we look for are industry certifications, um, which we have in a number of our courses, as well as post-secondary credentials. And then beyond the courses themselves, there are other major considerations that we look to, um, a prime one being instructor qualifications. At the very uh, basic uh, area, it's the DPI licensure required, but depending on the course, uh, the course may require a specific post-secondary degree, a professional certification, and or having required trainings that are involved in order to uh, allow them to teach that course. Uh, uh, thirdly, there are resource requirements, and these aren't just textbook resources, although those, those are considered, but we also consider instructional technology, uh, hardware and software technology, as well as any needed equipment for the various courses. And then finally, depending on the course we're talking about, uh, there may be specific facility requirements we need to consider. Uh, the, the final piece to mention is the work we do a lot of work behind the scenes with um, the Department of Technology as far as ensuring that the data we have for each course is accurate in order to be uh, accurately reporting to the state for all the various reports that they have publicly available as well. And then finally, um, two additional pieces to consider. Uh, when we look at course offerings, everything in the book are the courses that are offered in our district. We are able to run these courses in our district. Whether the courses actually run are determined by a variety of factors, which includes the number of student requests, um, the available fac faculty with the necessary credentials, as I mentioned, as well as if uh, individual schools have the fa uh, facility needs available to them. And then finally, the books you're seeing tonight are in draft form. The information in them is uh, accurate, but we do continue over the next uh, month, month and a half to work on design, formatting, wordsmithing, um, between now and when we send it for print in October. So welcome to answer any questions you may have. Go ahead. Um, on the changes, I noticed that one course, AP Music uh, Theory was being transferred from East to Preble and it listed um, the, uh, I believe it was licensure for the staff member. Am I correct on that? Let me. Sorry. Um, due to teachers' academic credentials. So when we have, my, my concern and question with that is we have a fine arts institute at East and I don't, I don't think it's a good policy to necessarily go staffed on individual people because people obviously leave with that, especially with the program like the fine arts institute at East. Um, 
what happens if that person from Preble leaves the district for some reason, or we're able to find someone with accreditation um, that would be able to teach the music theory class at East where we have the Fine Arts Institute? Is there a way that we can work with that to make sure that still happens? And does that happen in any other programs where uh, the... Sure, absolutely. And this really deal ties back to both course, uh, both schools still offer AP Music Theory as a baseline course. So that course as a foundation isn't changing. Because of staffing changes at East, East High School, there was no longer a teacher on their staff to be able to teach the course um, that had the credentials to meet the dual credit requirements. Um, the new hire that they had at uh, Preble High School later this summer did have those credentials and previously taught dual credit for music theory in a different district. So we were able to add that. Mm -hmm. So to your question of could we add it if the, the credentials came into play, the answer is yes, and we have done that in the past. But when it comes to advertising for our students, um, we don't want to have the course book mislead them onto what is available currently at their building. So a follow-up with that, according to the notes, it says it's removed from East and added to Preble due to academic credentials, the teacher's academic credentials. So a student at East, are they still able to take it as a dual credit class and receive those credits, even though it says that it was just removed from East? Uh, they would have to take the class with at Preble to receive the dual credit um, uh, course. The AP side of the course still would be available at East. The student could still take the AP exam uh, at the end of the course to um, potentially earn college credit based on their exam score. James. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Why don't you go ahead? I, I guess I'm I'm concerned with that and the ability, especially with if we have the Fine Arts Institute at East, of finding a way to make sure that that dual credit option is there because if it's if it's still being offered within the district, that a student doesn't necessarily need to go to Preble for it. And I'm wondering if this happens on a regular basis or I, I hope I'm being clear on it that some students may not be provided the same opportunity at their building when that program had been offered and the district had put some considerable resources into making a fine arts institute and and how we address that as a board to make sure that there's some equity in particular in that program and and other options with it so sure and that would be the the staffing decisions at the building at least in this immediate um uh, instance in the situation, uh, whether we could do something in the future that is absolutely possible. It's just what staffing is available to meet the college's requirements. Eric, do we force teachers to become certified or accredited to do dual credit? Uh, no, we don't. Do we provide resources or incentives to make that possible for teachers to get dual credits? especially in, in programs with that? It, it depends on the uh, institution we're talking about. Um, the, answer, the short answer is yes, um, that there are programs that <laughs> increasingly over the, next couple of, over the next couple of years that will require master's degrees and there are um, grants available for teachers who are interested in pursuing those credentials. And a follow up with that, is that a decision that's made at a building level or is that a decision that's made up at, at the district level? Uh, to which, to which degree? I just need some clarification. If a student, if if a faculty member is willing at East to go for that programming and, and offer that dual credit, and I'll use AP Music Theory as that because it's been previously offered as a dual credit option. Is it the decision of East faculty, or is it the decision of the district office whether we'll be able to provide resources for that staff member to get the accreditation so we can offer that programming? Because if it's if it's the board deciding on whether these course changes will come up, I think it should be a district level decision as far as whether we have the resources to provide accreditation at that. I think it's kind of passing the buck if we're going to take a class from one school to then say, okay, it's East, it's your responsibility to find that accreditation. We've just removed that class, which has become an, which has previously been offered, and now we're shifting it to a different high school due to the accreditation, I think we're risking the student body at one school to lose that opportunity because just because of a staffing issue on our part when the when the district employs the, st the staff members on that. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, it's my understanding that when grants are made available um, at the district level, we provide that information to all of our um, high school staff members so they can take advantage of that if they'd like to. And we, that's what we've done in the past. I'm assuming we'd continue to do the same thing. Andrew? I, get, I, I share, um, yeah, I share Brian's concern, it's especially because it's downgrading a music offering at the Fine Arts Institute. And, um, and doing so because of where an individual person is, is teaching. I mean, could we not have the, I mean, hypothetically, could the person who's qualified not teach one section at, at East and one section at Preble, even if it, even if numbers were small, I guess, it seems to me to be a different, a different kind of issue because it's a downgrade of an arts offering at, uh, at the school that contains the Fine Arts Academy. And I, I don't, I would, I guess I would prefer to find a way to have it be in both East and Preble's course offerings for next year, or if there's a good, um, reliable way that it could be offered, you know, remote, I, I would be open to listening to it, but I would really not like to see that come away from East because it has the Arts Academy. No, great feedback. And based on the comments um, from the board, we can certainly, as we go through the registration process and taking a look at teaching assignments for next year, um, see what we can do to make sure that there is a um, there's enough students at East that would like to take the course that we'd have the teacher come to East and take you know teach the class. Thank you, thank you, Judy. It's James is okay. It's the last follow up. And my and my concern with that is there's going to be students and and I'll freely admit my family is one of them that will consider where we open and where we enroll our students specifically based on the fine arts institute and the availability of those programs that are there as opposed to uh, different high schools within the district it's a program that we have really built up and have promoted and to have that opportunity for those students i think it it may impact some families decisions on whether they look at one school or another um, with that so thank you go ahead james Oh, go ahead, Nancy. I'm sorry. Just going to add and jump in here on here, Judy. Uh, since this is a draft, we still can make changes to it. So we could add to East into the East selection, what you're requesting, and then let it play out in the student scheduling. And then if we get enough students at East, I totally agree with you, you know, to run the course, then we, we certainly would run the course. So we definitely could add that to the course book it will come back to you anyway for the final approval so we'll note that you would I assume that you would like us to add that as an offering in east does that sound good <laughs> is that what you're asking brian yes. okay very good. thank you you bet all right james finally <laughs> i almost forgot my question <laughs> so what's the effort to date and evaluating this catalog of courses and their offerings and um, determining what the impediments to offering enrollment, and they have identified one scenario where it would be necessary for students from one school to enroll remotely into you know, courses offered by another um, another school. This is a problem that's only going to be generalized and, and grow as populations and student bodies really said so the scenario is there are too few requests for a course at West that has you know, sections available at Preble or East. What is, what's the evaluation? Where are we? Are there impediments to offering a, a way for students to enroll remotely and get asynchronous um, recorded con contents and, and participate in the course in another way? As far as accessing the course in another way, yes, we are in the process of putting all of our courses into um, Canvas in which we would offer that platform to be taught remotely by a classroom 
it's a hybrid model because it'd be taught, let's say in one school, but then others would distance uh, learning join the course. That's, that's one option. I think it's fair to say that um, every year we have students that travel from one school to another to just pick up a course. And that's not unusual in Green Bay, but yes, a remote option is something that we're working diligently on this year. As you know, we just purchased Canvas last year and that the whole, that's what we, we ran some uh, pilot programs on that uh, this summer and had great results uh, to the point all the teachers want it, but I'm not sure it's in the budget. <laughs> so <laughs> we are gonna do the 15 required courses. So that's the nature of the request to the board, is there a way for us to understand what it would take to get from point A to point B and, and offer a, a, an array of courses for remote enrollment to help us manage as we look at deficits and ways to make cuts without removing services to our students, right? We, we don't want to impact their education. So uh, as, a, as a strategy, going forward I, I need to be informed of what what's what's necessary to make that actually you know doable so uh, th thank you that's an excellent question what we can prepare for you is a detailed plan of the exact courses based on the request the student request but also it will probably take us two years to get all of the courses and get uh, shall i say to align for what the students are asking for and all the, we'll have all the courses and we're starting with all the ninth grade courses to begin. Um, but the goal by the end of this year is to have all 15 courses that are required for graduation to be available online. But we certainly can prepare for you. A, a, I would say a three-year plan, five-year plans make me a little nervous because it changes so fast, but certainly can do a, a three-year plan for you. Okay, anybody, go ahead. So as a follow-up to James' question on that, um, when students are able to enroll, if, I don't wanna give a lot of ifs and whens on that, but if a student was to enroll and take it in a hybrid model, is it a certain, is it at the same time, like are they able to join in with classroom discussions and does the bell schedule play into that? So, you know, if, they're offering language arts 10 at second hour at West and a student from East is in, do the bell schedules match up on that? Or is that something that would have to take some creativity with offerings and availability? So students aren't necessarily driving across the district, but we could figure something out. Yeah, and we have been trying to do that, but you're right. It is a challenge when we have um, four comprehensive high schools and three are on a traditional schedule and one is on a trimester schedule. Yeah, so that has been um, probably one of the biggest challenges. Um, we've already been doing a, some, um, for example, at our middle level and trying to provide offerings in French, for example, and we can't find French teachers and offerings. So being able to have students join the class at another school has been really helpful. Um, I know in talking with staying with the world language, Spanish is another area we're struggling in finding instructors. So can we build that course, place it on Canvas? And it'll be both. Can they join during the day as well as then being convenient for a student's schedule? Maybe they need to join it at another time and take the class asynchronous versus taking the hybrid. So I think we're keeping it open to different options that are going to meet the needs of the students. I would imagine the numbers of students that are requesting that are not huge and the motivation factor of a student to go into that will alleviate a lot of the other factors of I'm logging in late or I'm, you know, the, the determination of the student to go through those extra steps will help um, make it a little easier. So I'm sorry, I, I just quickly, I should have addressed uh, to your question. Next year, when the course books comes, the course book comes before you, there will be online hybrid options in the course book for students to select. So then we'll get the ball rolling as to the exact number of students and what courses they're most interested in. But the stage that we're at in our work right now is working um, diligently with our staff because they write and create the courses. And so we're working with them 
in creating those uh, 15 required courses, but they will all be in the course book as what we will have available for students to sign up. So right at registration, we'll know which students are interested in taking a hybrid course versus a face to face. Okay. Well, we have an actual student at our table. Did you have any questions, uh, Genevieve? I think um, I have a question about just kind of, it feels like a little bit like you're kind of picking and choosing which schools dual credit is gonna be offered at particularly with AP music theory, because like as a student involved in a lot of like band activities, that's dual credit is something I would love to see um, at all schools throughout the district. And I know that it's really difficult to find teachers, especially now, but I think kind of just cherry picking which schools you're going to focus that on isn't really fair to the district as a whole. So is there like any way to resolve that? I'm sorry. I don't think this is really about cherry picking. It's about the staff being qualified to provide that for dual credit. Um, I, I suspect we've done everything we can to make sure we can offer as many courses across the district as possible and provide that. Are you a problem? Yeah. Southwest. Okay. I I think the team is does everything they can to provide equal opportunities across the district. Um, do you have a thought about the hybrid option? Do you think that would be something that could help in the future? Right. Thanks, Jennifer. Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> um, in regards to, uh, I've had staff members reach out to me, um, and this might not be the the discussion point. So, um, over the availability to teach certain classes that have happened in, before that they've offered, and they've been told they won't be able to offer it, even though it's still listed in their in the course selection guide. So. The draft that you've given to us, we shouldn't assume that there'll be other exclusions of classes that are offered in there other than the changes that are being set now, dependent on enrollments and everything, you know, the, the criteria that you had before with it, those classes will be offered pending facilities, everything else, and, and most importantly, the registration for the class. And does that become a building level staffing? Like, if I want to teach and I'm licensed to teach three sections of one class that's a principal decision as far as individual course loads and who's got what classes on there okay thank you okay go ahead Don. the um the ibsl chemistry is that a two-year class or a one-year class oh uh, that's a one-year class the hl is the two-year class didn't we, didn't we approve this last year <laughs> i thought we because i remember after my kid really wanted to take IV chemistry at West and you didn't have it. So I, re I thought we did this last year. And I guess it's not super important, but we talked about, I thought we approved this last year. Yeah, that's fine. I was just, I was confused. I thought maybe they were doing a two-year SL, but. If, if that was the case, then we, like um, Ms. Byer said, we'd have to check. Um, it would be a situation where I, I know that they initially planned to start it this past year, but there was a, a updates to the curriculum at the IB level. Are you, we're not offering SL, are we? Not SL, HL? Chemistry? Uh, no, we're not. Okay, any more questions, anybody? Is there a way to find out what these changes would also, how it would impact the budget as far as concerns we have coming up in the next couple of years, um, the shifting of possible classes and additions and replacements for a ballpark number at some point. I'm trying to think of how we would do that. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts. I, I don't know if this course book is really gonna be the one that does it because we've kept it pretty consistent. And that's something, I, I'd like to say I've been in other districts. I've never seen a district work so hard to, hard to make sure our students have a variety of options. Um, I don't think this one will do that, Brian. Go ahead. 
I am amazed going off of what you said, having been in education and seen a lot of different districts at the amount of opportunities that our district offers and how wide and just the breadth of classes that we offer in the Green Bay Area School District. I'm proud of my, I'm proud of the fact that my kids go to school here because of the offerings that we have in this district, both at a middle school level and at a high school level. And I would be more than happy to put these up to any other districts in the area as far as the breadth of classes that we offer to help prepare our students to be ready for the community and the career and engagement and all the things that we talk about. I think we represent it in our course selections and the classes that we offer through our partnerships and within our district itself. And I think we should be proud of that fact. And you have done a great job of offering that and hopefully continuing to do that and just continuing to provide for our students on this. So thank you. Thank you for saying that, Brian. It, it's a good uh, way to end this conversation to remind people how much work and effort and time and um, that you guys put into this. I will second that. I'm very proud of what we offer in this district. Um, I, I wish I, I wish you know we get mired in these details a little bit, but that should be celebrated and often. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Next on the agenda is the charter school update, and we're going to hear from Renee Avery. Sorry, Renee is our director of innovative schools, and this is something that we bring to the board every year around this time. Welcome. Thanks. Good evening. Um, I did include the memo with the charter schools update. It's pretty much just a calendar update, but I also wanted to add a little bit of information because this is a, a very new board from the last time I had to give a charter update. And so one of the things I wanted to share, is you can see that back in May, we, the district had to provide the charter schools um, with documentation of what they were going to be reviewed on. But then I will also share that that person who typically reviews the charter schools has left our district. And so as the authorizing liaison and in um, communication with Vicki and with Judy, I asked if we could form a committee instead of having just one person. So I'm working with, it'll be myself, uh, the legal department, um, teaching and learning, and someone from community partnerships, because that's very important in the charter schools. And we are developing a review based on the contract and what it says that they are going to do. We're also kind of creating a template so that when this comes up again next year for JDAL to start this whole process, that we'll have something that we can follow. So um, in this memo, if you have or haven't had a chance to look at it, but you can ask the questions. Um, in that memo, um, that is what the committee is working on to, to provide or to make that review. And then the goal is to finish that by the end of this month because then NEW, and this is only for NEW right now because they're the ones who are in their four, starting their fourth year. Um, at the end of October, they are supposed to provide all the documentation necessary, again, pretty much to say we are doing what we said we're going to do according to the contract. Then we have then quite a bit of the school year for the committee then to go over all of that and assess do they have evidence that they are going to do or that they are doing what they said they're going to do. And if they don't have evidence, then we provide back to them suggestions about what they need to do. And then they have next school year, a half of a year, to uh, not only prepare a plan for how they're going to do that, but then to start doing that. Um, while that's all going on, you will be seeing um, an authorizer report on a consent agenda item, just so you can kind of see how things uh, have gone for the charter school in data for both charter schools. And uh, in February, a mid-year report will be coming too. And then in March, 
we will come back to present to NEW and the governance board, which I attend those meetings to, um, what they need to, I'm sorry, a written report of what they still need to do for the contract. And then in September, they will provide to you a plan of how they're going to make up for any areas that we felt they didn't have enough evidence. I also want uh, just to give you that reminder, and I know you all know, but it, it'll be kind of different for them. Uh, when I look back for JDAL on their first evaluation, they did a self-evaluation. That's pretty subjective. And of course, you're going to say you're doing well, and we are not doing that for them. But also the school had an entire year where it was pretty weird with COVID. And so there are some things, they might have more, th more items that they're going to have to be working on uh, to prove that they are doing what they set out to do. So I just kind of wanted to go over that and then see if you had any questions about the charter schools or this memo. Go ahead. Oops, go ahead. Well, and plus they've made this great big move now besides and it looks really good out there. It was a, I had a tour and it was wonderful. So thank you. It's it's been an exciting move and we're still having growing pains out there, but they're fun growing pains. So I appreciate that you were out there to visit. Any other questions? I can't believe NEW is in its fourth year. I mean, gosh. I mean, it feels like that was just yesterday when that was um, taking off. You know? I find that COVID does that about a lot of things. It's like yeah. two years are gone. Yeah. I was able to visit your new facility as well. It's very exciting. Yes. There you. on the first day of school too, you had some real fun stuff going on out there. So we, we did. It was great to have the kids walk through a limo and walk on the red carpet and yeah. have staff from both our school and NWTC greeting them as they came in the doors. Yeah. So it was a wonderful way to kick things off. Thank so, you. Go ahead, Brian. I've spoken with a couple of faculty members at NWTC and they are also excited just to see the partnership, how it's growing as far as just the engagement in the community with both institutions. And so from that side, I'm hearing some positive stuff as well. So I, I, I just want I appreciate to that. you Thank again you. and that it was, I talked to a couple the first day of school too, like you are very wanted out there. Like they're really happy <laughs> to to join, have you guys join them um, out there. So yeah, that's really nice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. I think that's it. Thank you so much. Okay. Now we're going to move to operations and under operations, the first item is the strategic budget planning update and that will be Don Smith. And that's going to be Vicki. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Vicki. <laughs> Does that mean I pass it on to someone else now? Is that how we're doing that? Genevieve, can you take this over? <laughs> okay. We're going to test out the clicker. Is it um, is it playing off of your laptop? Can you sh shift then the Yeah. Mm -hmm. Should we give it a try? Turn it on first. Okay. Yep. Ooh, there we go. Ooh, I'm going to go back one though. All right. Uh, I want to start by sharing that this gives me no pleasure. Nobody wants to talk about a budget deficit, especially in the public school world. Um, nobody on the team finds joy from this, but we also recognize and understand the importance of being honest and forthcoming and address this as a community. So my intent tonight is to use this time to provide the Board of Education and our community with an update on what we've been doing thus far 
to address a projected budget deficit of $36 million by the fall of 2024. Um, yeah, Danielle, you're up there. You see that? You're welcome. Uh, this isn't unique to Green Bay. I want to make sure everybody understands that. If you've been paying attention to the news across the state of Wisconsin and even at the national level, public education funding has been decreasing. But the rate at which Wisconsin public school funding is decreasing is very concerning. So I, I want to stress the part. This isn't unique to Green Bay Area Public School District. In conversation with my peers across the state, they are facing very similar. So why are we here? Why did we get in this spot? Uh, there are three main factors for us, declining enrollment. And again, this is not unique to Green Bay. Again, it is a national situation, declining enrollment, increased student needs, I'll, I'll give you an example. During COVID, we were given ESSER funds because there was a recognition that student needs did increase. We used that money in part to add uh, approximately 130 more staff members. The ESSER funds, along with what uh, Dr. Evers just proposed, are one-time funds. Student needs will not end on August of 2024. So declining enrollment, increased student need, and inadequate funding. So let's, let's take a look at the history here. Uh, forgive me for some of you that are well-versed in school funding, but I think it's important that we keep mentioning as often as possible how we got here. In 1993, revenue controls determined the district's ability to spend in the future. Districts that were fiscally responsible, in my opinion, were penalized because we were locked in at a rate. Green Bay Area Public School District, and this is before my time, before Angie, Angie, were you with us at that time? 93, you were probably still in grade school, for <laughs> God's sake. None of us were going <laughs> It was for all of our times. The people in place were fiscally responsible. We were penalized. We were locked in at a rate, a per pupil rate that was lower than $10,000, where other districts had a higher rate because they spent. The tool that the state provided us at that time to raise revenue limits is referendum. So those of you that are as old as I am, you might be thinking, my goodness, there were never this many referendums when I was younger. That's correct. That is the tool we were given, and that's why we're using it. State funding had also included inflationary increase to per pupil until the 09-11 budget. At that time, uh, they made a change at the state level. And this chart demonstrates, the board has seen this one before, uh, the actual, actual inflationary rate that we were provided as a school district compared to what it should have been. And that's millions of dollars that stayed in Madison and did not come back to Green Bay. The 21-22 school year, is it 21-22? Yep, in 22-23, we received $0 per pupil for inflation. If the budget, just to give you an idea of how much we're talking about, if the budget had been adjusted in the last two years for inflation, that would have been an extra $300 per pupil. And for our district, about $14 million. Uh, for the two years. For the two years, good question. Public school funding has not kept up with the cost of inflation. Uh, in this graph, you'll see uh, what inflation, if it would have kept up, that's the blue line and the orangish line is the actual. We did get a little relief in 2016. I think it's important to point out that an adjustment was made 
So districts like ours that were under $10,000 were given the opportunity to move up to 10,000. But what's important for the public to know on this one is that we still are behind other urbans. We are the lowest of the urbans. In addition to funding that hasn't kept pace, uh, for, in addition funding hasn't kept up with pace for uh, our specialties. So special education, uh, English learners, the reimbursement rate for special education in 1980 in the state was 66%. That means 60% 60 60 of what we spent for special education needs back then was reimbursed. Today, now on here it says 30, but Angie, it's actually less than that. Well, it's 30 if we're lucky, it might be 29. While at the same time, private schools are reimbursed at a rate of 90%. Now, Claudia, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, but I'm pretty sure that we actually hire staff, full-time staff to provide special education services to our private schools. Correct. I think it's important for the district, uh, for the board to know this. Uh, we hire a full time special education teacher and a full time speech and language pathologist for specifically for the private schools. We also have a full uh, evaluation team, special education evaluation team that we pay for for the private schools. This is a federal mandate. So we do all of the identification, testing, and uh, did I miss anything on that one, Claudia? Making the determination if they qualify for an IEP. Okay. So that's child find responsibility. So we have to, um, if there's a student out there who might possibly have a need for special education, it's our responsibility to seek them out and to do the evaluations and make the determination if they would qualify for special ed services in the Green Bay Area Public Schools, whether they choose they're ever going to come to the schools or if they've ever even stepped foot in our schools. Correct. How many special ed education students do we have in the district? 3,000. So I just want to clarify, and you said it, you know, for the people here in the district, but I just want to let the community know that what you're saying is that the Green Bay School District hires a special education, at least one speech language pathologist, a special education teacher, and we identify whether students would qualify for special education services for the private schools. Okay, so when we have questions of referendum, the, the community recognizes the fact that we're providing those special education services, which they're still getting reimbursed from the state. And that's a federal mandate. Yeah, and I think I, I speak for all of us in recognizing this is important work. So we're not denying that it's important to do. What we want to stress is the reimbursement rate and that if our politicians were looking for something that they could do to help us, that makes sense, uh, it would be an increase in this area. That's on a state and federal. Yes. Microphone. And that's at a state and federal level. That's correct. and. Um, I know Ms. McCoy and Lori Blakesley have been doing a lot of outreach, uh, not just to state legislature, but also at the at the national level to try to get some movement in this area. I also want to mention, um, because I think it's important to note that in the last budget, the legislature did provide some extra funding to meet maintenance of effort. So this is actually required for schools to qualify for ESSER funds. So there was additional funding that was given to the schools, but it wasn't a large amount. 
Uh, if you see 128 million, that sounds like a lot, but we're also talking about over 400 school districts that split that fund. The remainder of that funding, the 553 million went to property tax relief. Now I'm a homeowner, so thank you. Awesome, uh, but our school districts need it too. Did I get that right, Laurie? Okay, so that was the background on why we are where we are. What are we doing as a district to address this? Um, over the next two years, we will be utilizing ESSER funds. So I, I've said this before, and again, I'll mention it now, our finance department projected out where we were, where we were headed. They were wise in the decision to put funds aside that will get us through the 22-23 school year and the 23-24. Now, the wise way to deal with this um, is to start tackling this now. And we've actually been proactive um, for quite some time now. I'll talk about that in a minute. We don't want to be in a position where it is August of 2024 and now have to make some pretty significant decisions. Any reductions that we can make now uh, to decrease the, to decrease the overall reductions uh, will be beneficial. It spreads the reductions out over a two year period of time. It provides some stability and the time needed to ensure that what we're proposing for or reducing has the least amount of negative impact on student outcomes and our thriving workforce. I already uh, briefly mentioned the extra funds that Dr. Evers uh, proposed, I think it was last week or maybe two weeks ago, it was 90 million uh, for our district. That means uh, 1.8, but again, this is uh, one-time funding. We do appreciate it, we'll use it, but it's one-time funding and uh, does little to address our overall structural deficit. So uh, to date, the district has held two strategic budget planning retreats. One was with the cabinet uh, and the other was with our admin council. The admin council is made up of all administrators district-wide, so principals, associate principals, folks here at district office. We focused on two priorities during the retreat. One was uh, grounding in school finance. Before you make any decisions, uh, financial decisions, you really need to understand how schools are funded. And we also looked at uh, our current allocation of funds. And then we identified cost reductions, again, that would have little to no impact on student outcomes and our thriving workforce. Oh, so let's talk about those quick. Um, that's a list of the things that we've done thus far. Uh, we've talked already at the board table at least twice about the administrative cuts that we've made. And uh, just for the record, the 1.3 million that we talked about based on administrative cuts, that's not just those eight positions alone. That would be an extraordinary salary for eight people. This is in addition to, um, we, we reduced uh, APs at our schools based on methodology. And we also converted some administrative positions into non-administrative. So that's how we got to the 1.3 million that you had asked about, Dawn. And I, I think I mischaracterized it to make it look like it was just those eight, but it's it's more than that. Uh, we've, we've made software cuts. We had cell phone stipends, all of our faculty uh, staff administrators that are expected to be on call 24 seven. Uh, we were paying them a $600 stipend to do that. We've eliminated that. We've reduced our vendor contracts. We've reduced our hotspot fleets. We are bringing our graduation ceremonies back to the schools. Uh, we already talked about lunch trays going to the cheaper model. We've reduced our early release days. We are adhering more closely to the class size policy. Um, overloads, we've tried to reduce those as much as we possibly can. And then I had mentioned, uh, we're working on methodologies for all work groups to ensure not only equity, but uh, 
to help us make some difficult decisions. So, mm -hmm. Can I ask you about the overloads? Okay, so a teacher generally gets an overload when there's a class that needs to be taken, okay? So let's say you had, is it five classes that they, they're required to teach in middle school? Like, Who knows the number, yes. Five, okay. So then let's say that they're, they're short, a social studies teacher and they're qualified. So can't, to pick that one class up, wouldn't that be more beneficial than having somebody come across? Do you know what I mean? Because you lose an hour with the transportation and stuff. So I was, some couple people have asked me about that. And I, can you just give me a little more on that? Yeah, it would, um, and Judy can correct me if you need to, even if it's from afar. Um, we've been pretty liberal with overloads, even if the class sizes were under 20. So um, we're trying to tighten that up, Nancy. Oh, so you're actually, it's more of a class size thing then that prevents the, okay. See, I was thinking that if an overload was needed, that it would be just cheaper to do it that way then. Okay, all right, I get it. Judy, good? Judy, am I good? Okay. <laughs> uh, um, this is no secret. Uh, staffing makes up for 80% of our total budget. Angie's mentioned this to you anytime she's come forward with budget information. Uh, that's for salary and benefits. As we work to align staffing with our declining enrollment, reviewing all vacancies that come up. So through attrition, um, we look at, is this a position that we absolutely need to fill? Or is it something that we can put on hold right now? Or is it something that we can actually eliminate? The total number of staffing reductions will that we will need to make over the next few years, <clears throat> frankly, is going to be dependent upon our ability to cut in other areas. But when 80% of our budget is staffing, uh, it's certainly something that we need to look at. We are monitoring the number of positions on a daily basis. And at this point in time, in fact, I think it was just this morning, Josh, uh, this date to last year, we've had a reduction in overall staffing of 105 FTE. And uh, full disclosure, which I shared with the board in the memo and for the public now, that does include 42 positions that are posted and just not filled at this time. Those aren't just educator positions, but it is 105. Attrition, uh, evaluating those positions through attrition is key. In addition to the reductions we have already made, we are in the process of uh, creating a handbook committee to take a look at benefits. The board will be involved in those decisions at some point. We currently have a stipend and rider committee taking a look at um, where we give them, why we give them. There's some inequities that we need to address with riders and stipends. We are taking a look at uh, presenteeism might be a new word for some of you. Um, We'd rather focus on the benefit that our kids get because they have high quality staff standing in front of them in a classroom uh, versus them being absent. Last school year, we spent $4.6 million on substitutes. Now COVID played a role in that. This year we've set aside uh, two to 3 million so we're hoping for a substantial reduction. But part of that is we need to make this a great place to work. 
So the board, we've we've talked about professional workday and what that means. Uh, we think that doesn't cost us anything to treat our educators like the professionals that they are. And we hope that as we implement that fully this year, that the staff recognize how much we respect them and appreciate the work they do for our students. And in turn, we hope that increases their presenteeism. We are in the process of a district office uh, identifying a program evaluation model, along with a cycle of evaluation. Um, every successful school district does this, and Dr. Wiegand has taken the lead on making sure we have this in place. This coincides with a review of career pathways to ensure we're providing our students with relevant courses that support their post-secondary options. Class size is under 20. We have some that have to run because of special education needs or English language learner needs. This is something we really need to focus on. Last school year, we offered at the secondary level 580 courses under 20 students. Um, we've worked really hard to start reducing that and we're down to 353 at this time. But I think it's really important to make sure everybody understands what that means. Classes under 20 uh, are luxury and reducing them means uh, impact on budget. We also need to consider early retirement incentives like we did last year. Uh, we asked staff to identify early on, I think uh, as early as November, um, okay, uh, to let us know if their intent was to retire at the end of the year. Um, that gives us a better handle on attrition and which spots do we need to backfill and which ones can we not fill. We also need to be prepared in the event that layoffs are needed. We need to be prepared for that. So the, the district team is going to be working with GBEA to ensure we have solid language in the event that we do need to move towards layoffs. So um, there might be some questions about referendum and how does that fit in? The referendum that we are coming to the public with in November does not address our deficit. This is a capital referendum. Despite our deficit, we still have a district to run and we still have facilities to maintain. So this referendum uh, addresses delayed and deferred maintenance that needs to be done. Regardless of our upcoming deficit, like I said, we still need to maintain our facilities. Uh, it's important to mention any time we get the opportunity that uh, mill rate will go down, even with the passage of the referendum based strictly on Green Bay Area Public School District's impact on mill rate, it will go down. We're focusing the majority of the project, projects on the secondary level, that's purposeful because the board in 2023 will receive the facilities master plan along with task force recommendations. And most likely those recommendations will impact our elementary schools. So the goal with this referendum, uh, the facilities master plan will to allow the district to gain operational efficiencies. We want, uh, you know, I think it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it. We want to make sure that we have facilities to be proud of and that our kids deserve. This is a draft timeline um, subject to change, but right now this is the plan. Uh, this winter, we want to hold two more retreats, budget retreats. One would be with a district group made up of staff from all of our groups and the other for the Board of Education. 
so we can publicly demonstrate the whole process. Uh, we would focus on the two priorities again, school funding uh, and how we allocate our funds. So a little deeper dive than the board has seen in the past. And then um, start with the discussion about what, what are opportunities for reductions. Through February and March, a task force will convene to review the facility's master plan. And then the goal is to have that plan presented to the Board of Education in April. So this will all tie together. You will get the facility's master plan recommendations from the task force, along with recommendations on potential areas to cut. This will not be easy work. This won't be easy. But a strong, healthy board is going to help us immensely. Not everybody's going to be happy about the recommendations. We know that it's 36 million, for goodness sake. Uh, but I, I feel confident we're going to be able to get through this. I'm hopeful that the state or federal government will step in. Anybody else hopeful there? Or you can just look at these kids, right? It's the reason we're here. It's the reason we're here. Yep. All right. What questions do you have? James. So when it comes to planning a response to this deficit, you have um special activities um occurring around budget planning um what is the district doing to move other um areas away from business as usual operations to planning for the impact of budget specifically curriculum development you know the question i asked um this evening was purposeful in that if we take a business as usual approach and velocity towards evaluating, can we offer hybrid or whether solutions while we accelerate budgetary planning, I don't see that coordinating very well. So I'd like to suggest to the district that uh, holistically we look at all of the areas and not just scope this as a deficit, but we cannot not perform our mission, right? So at the end of the day, I will look at this and say, we were successful if we could balance the budget without relinquishing access to all the opportunities that our students enjoy now. And that's gonna take work and creativity and a, a, a solid effort by non-budget uh, oriented individuals of how can they continue to, to deliver services with less um, and have the big quality services. Brian. And related to that, um, there's mention of handbook committees being discussed and I would I would hope and trust that any decisions regarding handbook language has a clear fiscal impact on it and it is not an opportunity to change things that could may have been the desire of people to have changed for the sake of tying it into some budget item when there is no real need to because while we want to maintain our employees and make sure that we are keeping the ones that are here because we have trained them they're working with our students that we lose institutional knowledge when we have them and recognizing that there may be some handbook discussions, I would stress that we do not take this opportunity to just change things for the sake of changing things and that there's clearly a fiscal impact and that it's our expectation as a board that this is not an opportunity just to change things and tie it into the budget when there's really no need to change it related to the budget. I think it, I think it helps improve morale and it maintains our employees. Any other questions? I, I just have a, a few. Um, 
Oh, oh sorry. Go, go ahead, Andrew. Yes. So with I guess with with regards to with regards to class sizes under twenty, um, there are two approaches, and there's there's one of the two I can support, and one that I am prepared to to fight hard against. The one I'm prepared to fight hard against is simply <clears throat> just cutting courses that don't have 20 registrants for it. Um, there are there are creative solutions to this. There are classes that can be, and I'm not saying this is always the answer because I don't want to see everything co-taught, but there are classes where maybe two sections can happen at the reasonably happen at the at the same time as a last alternative to not running them. But um, I am not planning to vote for a lot of cutting of small but necessary classes, uh, but I would vote for smart combinations or shared or classes with at the secondary level classes with a a distance component. Um, I agree with James that it cannot be, it cannot be business as usual. Um, at the same time, I don't want every single class to just be hybrid to get more more kids into it. But I think in some cases that'll be the answer. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I'd, I'd just like to say that, first of all, I want to thank Vicki for her leadership and her team for their leadership on this. This has been hard, grim work at times, um, and they've been extremely proactive because that's what is called for right now. So... Um, I'm hoping I'm hoping that uh, you know these the changes that are going to be necessary aren't going to be forever. That we can get through this tight spot over the next few years, and that um, you know it, it, times change, and we'll be able to maybe um, revisit some of these decisions at, at, um, in a few years. We can hope for that. I don't know that that will happen, but we can hope for that. Um, hopefully our state legislature will uh, step up, do the right thing. Um, I know that districts across the state are begging for help. Um, it's, it's all through this state, this, this um, same scenario. And um, I mean, last week the governor was here visiting one of our schools and you know, I, I got a, a chance to just grab a few words with him and he, you know, he acknowledged this. Um, it's a, it's, the state legislature could fix this and they're choosing not to. There's a large budget surplus in this state. And, um, and, everyone knows it's there and i'm i don't know what you know i don't know what the future holds but i i just want to acknowledge that our here in green bay that those hard decisions are being made and they will be they will continue to be made for um the first foreseeable future until we are fiscally stabilized so anyway um that's all i have to say about that at this point is there any other questions, Brian? I think it's also important to recognize that the Green Bay School District for as long as I've been familiar with it has always been fiscally responsible and that the slide showed it with the $10,000 level at that point. And we have been fiscally responsible with our for our students' needs. And especially when you look at the per student allocation for funding and we have students it's expensive to educate i mean we have we have a very we have some very high need students that it, it's expensive to educate and i think we do a great job of it and we need to continue with it so yeah what's it excuse me just a moment melissa 
I'm here. Would it be okay for the board to recess for 10 minutes? If we make a motion? Yep, go ahead. I'd like to make a motion that we recess for 10 minutes. Second. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I think it passed, Melissa, so we're in recess for 10 minutes. Thank you. Brian, can you just give me a call on my cell phone? Yes. Thank you. Uh, could someone call and let me know what's happening? Andrew, we're just trying to reassess. Um, we'll let you know. Okay, is everyone, Andrew, are you on? I'm here. Okay, I would entertain a moment to adjourn, or a, mo a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. Aye. You have been watching the Green Bay Area Public School District's Board of Education meeting please visit the school district's website, www.gbaps.org, to view the program again. If you cannot fully access the information on this video, please let us know the accessibility issue you are having by calling 920-448-2025 or by email at communications at gbaps.org 
we will try to provide the information to you in an alternative format and or make the necessary improvements to make the information accessible.